Uh, it feels a bit weird, the sound coming from so close to uh, <laughs> But uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Robin, Robin Vijay Thomas. Uh, you will see this uh, Thomas Robert with as my website. Uh, if you want to connect with me, you can check that. That's the content and all of those slides there. Uh, how many of you here are familiar with IoT? Okay, that's uh, a lot more than I expected. So the last time I gave an IoT talk um, at a slightly generic crowd meetup, uh, I went into a lot of depth of IoT testing and people were getting a bit bored, so I made it a bit abstract. But again, the talk was pretty much prepared for 30, uh, just over 30 minutes, 45 minutes. So we'll have plenty of time for discussion and uh, the crowd today seems to be quite engaging. Uh, we had a lot of great discussions during the last talk, so feel free to interrupt me at any point of time and uh, we can go into more details and depth as necessary. So a uh, quick introduction, uh, I, um, as I mentioned, I work in a startup called IoTify. We are into uh, IoT testing, stateful simulation of devices. Uh, not going into a lot of depth there today, but uh, the, being a startup, you wear a lot of hats. Uh, the, the one that I like is technical architect, that's what I put there, but I handle a lot uh, in terms of solutions architecture. Uh, basically, uh, you are given a problem, find a solution for it. So everything from uh, Kubernetes deployments, uh, and I see a few familiar faces from Kubernetes community days that happened uh, last weekend. So, uh, and as, I, as also is mentioned here, I'm a generalist, or uh, you can consider deep start, basically troubleshooting. Some problems involve you uh, working from C sharp or to Bash to JavaScript to Vue.js uh, in the same debugging scenario. Uh, at the same time, deploying in ECS, EKS, or all of that. So um, it, it, it forms a lot of roles of an integration engineer. You you kind of do what is necessary. So deep stack is a buzzword that I. So IoT for the few that are not quite uh, familiar with it. Also, my presentation will not have a lot of useful information. It's just visual aids. Uh, I, I prefer uh, communicating or engaging with the crowd more. Uh, there's not going to be a lot to read here. So uh, IoT for the for those who are not familiar with that field is basically what you see here is uh, the fridge reminding you to not forget to buy milk. So, uh, as, as funny as that is, you can think of the tech in the world in making that happen. This is not just a joke, this is a reality right now. If you Samsung uh, Opera House, uh, in, at Samsung Opera House, if you basically go, you'll see fridges that have cameras inside them. So you can, you can see what's inside the fridge without even uh, opening the fridge. It also has object uh, detection and recognition to understand what the level of milk or whatever groceries that you have is it. Also it does an inventory system, so when you buy fresh produce, uh, it updates the uh, inventory of whatever is available to you. Right? And it does suggestions in terms of recipes that you can do, uh, when you need to replenish that, even integrate with Alexa uh, as necessary. Is the audio fine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. So, uh, yeah, you automatically place orders as necessary, all of that is possible. But, like, really think of the tech that's happening. It, uh, there is a camera or there is a sensor of some sort within your fridge that's doing some object detection, it's doing some classification, it sends data to a remote server, uh, it's as debatable as the privacy or whatever by, uh, considerations there are. Uh, that's one way to do it. And uh, there's some business logic that's going on, and then some actuation or some implementation or some action gets taken place uh, with that uh, information. Right? So that's basically what IoT is, and uh, it can be anything these days. Easiest thing is a smart light. So uh, your Wipro, Cisco lights that you can control with your phones. Uh, that's that's how it all started, and now we are in this crazy mess where if you want to get anything to work, you need to have like a dozen apps on your. So uh, it's, it's a slippery slope about what is what you can enable with IoT and what uh, where, where you should pretty much draw the lines there. So um, in in pursuit of convenience, we might end up creating something super inconvenient. 
and there are business considerations. For example, like in the previous slide, there was a uh, block of politics that was uh, intentionally left out. Right? Similarly, there are business interests uh, that often factor into whatever architecture or whatever we are going to talk about today that we are not, uh, like, from an idealistic point of view, we do not consider as much. Uh, so, IoT really was the buzzword, for example, right now, generative AI is your uh, go-to keyword, right? Everywhere, uh, even today, there are at least two gen uh, generative AI meetups happening in Bangalore. And uh, wherever you go, for example, if you want promotions or whatever, you implement generative AI into your uh, infrastructure, and that's that's sort of the business requirement. So IoT was in such a stage in 2000, uh, let's say 12 to 15, you can say, uh, when it was the buzzword, you're connecting everything to IoT. And every uh, every engineer is trying to uh, enable some IoT application or IoT features into their existing product. So that's, uh, that's where the infancy of the technology is. So your toaster or your coffee machine, uh, making coffee right up as, uh, as you wake up, or your um, uh, your car basically telling you what the nearest uh, gas tank is or a refueling station is as your tank, uh, tank levels get depleted. Um, so applications are endless. Again, you have to sort of think of this slippery slope, right? Uh, for example, NFTs. How many of you know what NFT is? Non fungible tokens. A lot of people. If you are, if you open your Google News feed, uh, probably uh, October, September, October of last year, it was at its peak, right? You can't, you can't open Google News without uh, coming across the term NFT. And how many of you think NFT is a joke, or <laughs> right? Uh, I personally think the technology is quite uh, inspiring. Uh, I personally think that blockchain and uh, NFT had a lot of potential. It's just it just got completely sidelined in in this gimmick of art or organizations or whatever that happened, and the lot of the scams that happened, and technology got sidelined there, right? And it was also in its infancy. Similarly, IoT uh, sorry, IoT had such crazy adoptions where even even where it did not make sense, people were just connecting things to IoT. There were a lot of uh, issues that happened in terms of privacy, data breaches, uh, cases where um, IoT security was also in its infancy. So uh, unfederated access to your home security cameras, uh, things like that, that were genuine concerns. All of that happened. So this is this I guess is about 2015. Yeah, so July 2015. Uh, and IoT is right at its peak over here. Uh, so, fast forward to let's say 2017, you can see IoT as such, it's a bit blurred, but uh, IoT as such, it's a, in, in and of itself is not very real. IoT pretty much got broken up. You can see IoT platforms coming up here. Uh, you can see uh, digital twins somewhere here. So IoT as the topic is quite vast. So just to enable uh, these, these communications or these features that we said, it is quite difficult to just uh, have all of that under one stack, right? Even, even if you consider uh, in terms of an engineer, there has to be electronics engineers, uh, you, you need your VLS, VLSI guys for uh, low level chip design that's very power efficient and uh, those kinds of uh, design constraints and criteria that you have to factor in. You need telecommunication engineers for physical layers. You need uh, you need systems engineers for data ingress. You need for ML engineers for processing and analytics. So it, it's it's generally not the case that one technology that you see on one of these stacks uh, stays intact. It gets as it gets more matured, it gets broken up into different uh, components. So that's that's sort of what you see here happening around 20 century. By the way, uh, I do, is there anybody here who does not know what the start is, the Gartner hype cycle? Oh, okay, so Gartner, Gartner is a consultancy company, but every year they basically put uh, out this report called, or, or rather the start called the Gartner uh, hype cycle. And it's uh, it's a very uh, controversies or uh, radical opinions aside, it's a good way to 
uh, see where new and upcoming technologies are in terms of adoption. So you have your uh, you have your basic uh, stages like innovation trigger, peak of inflated expectation. So you have that first initial uh, rocket launch stage where it's innovation trigger. So that a lot of engineers are doing a lot of cool stuff and uh, basically ramping up the technology to its peak potential. This is when it starts to get its um, market awareness and uh, people start noticing it. Then uh, your, uh, let's say, slightly more business-centric guys kick in looking for the next big thing and then they uh, try to put that technology into everything. So eventually when technology reaches the uh, peak of infl inflated exp uh, expectations, uh, I can't say to talk to you. And then it's there's a very uh, steep fall. So, for example, I think I haven't checked the latest uh, hype cycle for where NFTs are, but right now it's a bit of radio silence in terms of NFTs, right? <laughs> that's that's sort of that tough call. And then eventually, I still have hope that realistic applications of that technology will come up. That's this slope of enlightenment and then uh, plateau of productivity. So uh, it, it basically shows the evolution of a technology from uh, pure hype, uh, where it's the good hype that uh, fuels a lot of innovation, then that inflation stage where it's taken beyond what it's meant to be, that fall that happens successively where real, reality kicks in, and then eventually it finds a good product market fit where it's actually practical. So IoT, uh, uh, like I mentioned earlier, it was here you know, around 2015-ish. Then it uh, then it started falling, and other components of IoT kind of got uh, broken up, and then it's reaching a maturity phase. And I guess in 2022, uh, the start isn't fully fleshed out, but uh, IoT is. Oh, you can see NFTs there. Uh, you can see IoT is. Several components of IoT would be somewhere along the uh, second half of this. As in enterprise and businesses, like serious businesses are adopting things uh, and creating real life applications of it. So I met somebody earlier today who was working on logistics uh, and uh, last mile connectivity, um, your sensors for example, what Samsung's doing. All of these, whenever it's enterprises, uh, enterprise centric stuff, you need uh, stability and practicality and business outcomes, right? It can't be just for the sake of it. Um, so yeah, that's that's basically what happened with uh, IoT. That's a summary. It it was sort of in its peak in 2012, 2015. Uh, it went through that trough of dissolutionment, and now it's, uh, in my opinion, or uh, the trends that you're seeing, it's essentially a realistic adoption. And it's it has a good amount of market penetration because of the insights that it can have. Right? You're dealing with electric cars, uh, your um, electric uh, scooters, Aether, for example. You can do a lot of predictive maintenance stuff. Uh, for example, if you have server racks or uh, data center infrastructure, you can monitor how the temperature variations are happening. You know the optimum temperature for the silicon uh, beyond which it might start uh, long-term degradation. So for example, if you take AWS data centers or if you take real uh, super huge data centers, uh, the long-time life quite matters quite a bit, right? When, you, when you're talking about your gaming PC, it's all about the gigahertz. Let's say, how can it cross three gigahertz, four gigahertz? But server components generally don't get pushed that far because Sustainability matters, your power requirements matter, the life of the component matters, you can't just keep charging through hardware. Right? So you try to optimize the, let's say, operating temperature versus the performance. Uh, so all of that involves a lot of data acquisition, a lot of telemetry. Even uh, Aether, I think they have uh, this uh, predictive maintenance of batteries, like battery replacement, their battery warranties, all of that. Uh, Basically, you can get a call from your service center before the problem in your vehicle uh, escalates to a real uh, actual problem. Right? Uh, again, you can uh, ask about the privacy concerns or that, but I think that's a 
uh, that's that's quite an interesting application of it. So if if your uh, what a couple of my juniors in college they worked on this predictive maintenance system wherein they were listening to uh, the sound of machines, the sound that machines were making. So like a lathe, for example, in mechanical engineering, lathe is something that you use to fabricate cylindrical or uh, things with a circular cross section. So those have a lot of gears. And so if, the, if those gears are misaligned, abrasion can happen. And uh, by the time a human really notices what's going wrong, that, that abrasion might have gone too far. If it's at an early stage, you can just correct the alignment and things would have been fine. So what they were trying to do was basically uh, take sound samples and then run it through an ML filter, try to find uh, differences between normal operation and uh, abnormal operation and then send out notifications to maintenance engineers. Same thing applies to your cars, your scooters, whatever it is, right? So those are some of the real uh, practical applications of uh, IoT that can happen. So uh, basically <laughs> as we are going through this uh, adoption, people are sort of finding focus areas. Now most of the, let's say, engineers that are graduating sort of go into that orthodox stream of uh, Typical system architecture where you find either you go into data engineering or you go into uh, say application development, things like that. People are still finding their way around uh, IoT development. So, again, uh, telemetry, data ingest, uh, all of those are different components under this. So, uh, this, this concepts might, these concepts might find its way into something or the other that you are actually working on uh, that can be extended to this. So uh, let's, the, the title of the talk is Challenges in uh, Architecting IoT Systems. But, uh, so let's, let's just take a very quick overview of what are traditional software systems. The talk before this was incredibly exhaustive of all of the design and architectural considerations that you can make in terms of microservices. Uh, I do not aim to go that far into detail um, and uh, definitely I cannot surpass what was already presented here, so that was amazing. Um, so this is just something that I put together, this is probably the most generic uh, uh, system architecture that you can find here, probably any company in its infancy, uh, probably um, startups here or small to medium businesses that have some kind of a web application presence might follow something along these lines. So you have your client, uh, that can be a phone, that can be a browser, whatever, communicating over HTTP. You have a load balancer or your API gateway that looks for access restrictions. You have your messaging bus, say Kafka, NATS, whatever it is, internal communication. You have microservices here. Uh, that's what I'm familiar with, so I have a bias to that. That's why I represented it as microservices there. Uh, databases um, connected to each service. Um, and that, that's your generic uh, system here, right? Uh, if, you, if you want to, say, uh, bring up, uh, like come out with a new startup, this is, this is probably the service that you would go with. Uh, maybe not split into services, but again, we are going into that uh, microservices versus monolith discussion. Let's stay on topic in terms of uh, IoT systems. So, um, uh, IoT systems, again, so this classification methodology, this is the most uh, this is the most prevalent one that you can come across. Either you can see a three layer or a five layer uh, architecture. Both are fundamentally the same. It's like uh, on how much granularity that you want to go. So uh, first layer in both cases is perception. So perception uh, is sensing. So uh, let's consider agricultural uh, IoT. So uh, a lot of farmers they have that innate feel on how much moisture that the soil needs, right? But we engineers, we try to quantify that. So let's say a soil moisture sensor. It's quite, uh, I'm, I'm sure everyone here is from a science background, so, uh, and uh, pardon me if I tend to jump around into electronics now and then. So a soil moisture sensor is quite uh, simple. There are two probes that stick into the soil, and uh, water in its purest form is not conductive but with all the minerals in the soil, there will be some amount of current that goes through it. So it essentially, the sensor essentially measures uh, the current that flows through the soil 
and comes up with an analog uh, range of values. Right? This is the electronics end of things. Now we need to take this all the way to the cloud. So let's look at certain like how that goes through. So that that lowest block of uh, uh, device is can be called perception. What is perception? Your understanding of the environment. That's why I put sensing in brackets. Perception or sensing. You'll see perception in the diagrams. Uh, I prefer sensing. Um, so you can consider this uh, soil moisture sensor. So that's that's basically two wires connected to the ground, connected to an amplifier circuit. That's it. But uh, now this needs network access. It needs to connect to a computer of some capacity. It needs to send it to some uh, endpoint. So you use a microcontroller there. Now in a field, these can be spread across acres. Right? So you can't have one uh, computer that's entirely Ethernet enabled. Or you can't have like an Intel Atom processor or uh, uh, something of that computing caliber spread out through the fields. You have to run wiring, all of that, non practical, right? So there is a transport layer that comes uh, next. So this can handle. This can. This varies uh, quite a bit in terms of application. One of the most popular things in this agricultural uh, sector is called LoRa, abbreviation of long range, that uses megahertz range of um, uh, radio waves, essentially. So even in your uh, mobile phone, you might see 2.4 gigahertz, 2.4 and 5. Those are gigahertz range. Um, your FM is 91.9 or whatever megahertz. So just putting things into perspective, this is around 433 megahertz is what LoRa runs on. If you want something in your uh, home, so your, uh, let's say Philips Hue, you might get ads on, uh, on uh, Amazon or whatever. Philips Hue uses a hub, uh, hub and spoke model in, uh, essentially in, some, in most cases, yeah. So the hub essentially communicates to, uh, hub is what has IPv4, your IP connected to your IP capability. The light bulbs themselves may not necessarily have, in the case of Philips Hue, uh, have IP access. So in those cases, you use something called Z-Wave. Those are all Z-Wave or Zigbee. These are all gigahertz ranges. You need more throughput uh, in some applications, so you use uh, Z-Wave. In some cases, your Wipro, your, Wipro, your Cisco lights, those connect directly to your Wi-Fi router. Those have IP capability. They use something called ESP-266. Like that's a microcontroller with uh, an IP stack embedded right within. Uh, so in the in that case, that's uh, Wi-Fi is essentially your plan. Now, uh, you will come across, you can go deeper into that communication stack, but for the sake of time, let's move on. You have your processing. So, uh, now we are talking from the sensing side. So, our uh, soil moisture sensor sends the soil moisture, sent it over this LoRa to say the pump house or whatever, contains a Raspberry Pi or a small computer that can receive LoRa signals uh, and transported it to whatever uh, AWS, IoT, or DCP, or Google Cloud, or whatever it is. Now you need to process that data. You need to accept that message, ingest it, store it for a later retrieval, and your application essentially is uh, what do you what do you need to do with that data? So uh, your standard action plans. If the say the farmer set a rule saying that if the soil moisture level goes below a certain percentage. Turn on the uh, turn on your pump house or pump house or solenoids or whatever. So that can be one application of it. Uh, business on the business front, say if you want to take some kind of uh, business logic. So a lot of IoT solutions get marketed similar to SaaS software as a service. So uh, say if you want to put some kind of rate limiting or if you want to put the user behind a paywall, all of those business logic comes under the comes under business. That's why it's not as relevant when you talk about the core technology. Uh, so, since I explained this, I think that can be sort of understood. Let's move into, this is like a basic uh, IoT system based on the AWS app. So, you can, uh, talking in terms of cloud providers, most cloud providers have uh, an IoT solution. Uh, but everything is getting consolidated towards uh, AWS. Google kind of recently closed down their IoT offering. Azure is rumored to close down soon. Uh, it's a rumor, nothing 
confirmed, but AWS is pretty much thriving because we have the entire infrastructure to run Alexa. We, we can keep it open because IoT is a very tough problem. There's a lot of resources involved. Uh, in most cases, the cloud providers are making a loss uh, on it. So uh, they have very little incentive to keep it running. And consolidation happens to the largest players in this in this space is AWS. So you have your IoT core, which is uh, essentially where most of these uh, things happen. Uh, if you want to get started, or just out of curiosity, if you want to tinker with some things, you can get started with AWS IoT core. Uh, anybody familiar with Arduino here? Uh, okay. So Arduino is uh, sort of like an abstracted programming language specific for electronics. That's uh, essentially the easiest way to get started with most of these things. Uh, Arduino itself, if you are talking about Arduino Uno with an Ethernet connectivity or something, it's very tough to get connected with this because Arduino itself does not have the processing capability to negotiate the security. Uh, but anything from a Raspberry Pi upwards, you can definitely connect to this. Or even ESP8266 you can connect to this. Uh, AWS has this thing called a device shadow. It essentially reflects what your physical state is. So if your soil moisture sensor connected to that microcontroller is sending data to AWS, AWS maintains a copy of the last received message. So in case uh, you want to do some analytics or operations on it, you can query the shadow device to uh, retrieve what the last state of that device was. Um, you have, uh, there are several machine learning pipelines within the AWS stack. Uh, machine learning is not my area of expertise. Uh, but you can um, essentially connect, say, Lambda functions to that. Uh, to serverless or not to serverless is a debate in and of its own entirely. Uh, but all of those are design considerations and architecture considerations. AWS pretty much has a product for each and everything that you can think of. And data exchange to your external systems. So say you want to use SMS, uh, secure not notification service to send a push message to a farmer. All of that can be done within the stack. It's just a brief overview. On the other side, you have IoT green grass. Uh, that's like a general purpose operating system. So one thing uh, about IoT is it's literally a distributed system uh, in, in the very essence of the word. Once that product uh, sort of leaves your uh, factory premises, you have very little control over it unless you want to do a recall and then uh, do some kind of uh, replacement for your customer. Once the uh, software is flashed, your premises, it's literally out there. Uh, you can't basically go into your server room and do an upgrade or you can't uh, the, do that similar to how, you, how your IT department handles uh, this thing. So there a concept called FOTA comes in, firmware over the air. So you put in certain logic that allows your company to securely put, put uh, some kind of uh, firmware within some temporary memory reboot the device and flashes uh, the latest version of the phone weather. So uh, IoT green grass, AWS IoT green grass, uh, again provides certain abstractions because you have diverse hardware. So hardware that's compliant with green grass, you can have certain abstractions that you can work with to efficiently and effectively get things out the door uh, fast with peace of mind. So this is sort of the uh, architecture that I've mentioned. Whatever happens in the backend for IoT is super niche. That it's, it's, it does not uh, really make sense for me to cover uh, a, set, a specific IoT architecture here because uh, within, with every client that I've worked with, the architecture differs a lot. So this is again a generic uh, view of things. So uh, you have your sensor and actuator that I mentioned there. So let's take the pump house example itself. Moisture sensor connected to microcontroller, connected to pump house over uh, LoRa, as, you, as I mentioned here. So that's that first part, LoRa radio. Edge gateway, cloud gateway, I'll explain in a minute. Uh, when to that business logic, uh, sorry, application logic, it fired a signal back saying the soil is too dry, turn on the pump. The signal sort of goes back down the line, and then your actuator comes. Actuator does actuation, as in it influences the environment. Sensing sensors perceive the environment and actuators uh, influence the environment in some capacity. So that can be similar to a relay, which is like an electromagnetic switch, closes the circuit, turns on the phone. Um, 
So yeah, now difference between edge gateway and cloud gateway, this is, uh, since I have a lot of architects in the room, uh, I want to sort of drill down this terminology because uh, that is the biggest confusion that happens whenever we are talking with a client. Because uh, sometimes people just say gateway and you and, and they'll, they'll use gateway in either of these situations and then it's up to us to sort of understand what their infrastructure is actually talking about. So everything in the uh, sort of like the back end of things or within your business logic side of things is the cloud gateway. So when you sign up with AWS IoT, uh, your IoT core will give you a, uh, an endpoint, uh, an SQDN, a fully qualified domain name that you can use to connect that. So that's a point of ingress, ingress as in accepting data uh, for your uh, whatever your IoT system is. That can be considered <coughs> a cloud gateway. It's hosted by someone else. Edge gateway is whatever is sort of you can consider physically on prem. So let's say in the case of Philips Hue, you have a, a hub. The hub can be considered an edge gateway. So if it's like a hub and spoke model you are a star topology, you, you have your peripheral devices connected to that hub, which is what has your IP stack connecting to the cloud gateway. Now this sort of abstraction can be happen. So this kind of goes for a toss when you're talking about your Wipro or Cisco, or Cisco uh, bulb or whatever, when the MCU itself is communicating to whatever cloud gateway that is. Right? So, uh, edge is closer to your actual sensor, cloud is closer to your actual cloud infrastructure. Uh, now, once the data reaches the cloud gateway, now you need to do something with it. That, that's where you come up with your aggregator or stream processor. So, uh, let's say, uh, so I'm, I'm assuming everyone here is familiar with SCTP, right? Now, SCTP cannot be directly used in IoT because of certain design considerations like the power consumption, the, uh, the the fact that both devices have to be online all the time, uh, or at least during the point of communication. So your web sockets, service sentiments, those things generally do not work very well in this concept. We use something else called MQTT, message queuing telemetry transport. So that's like a pub sub model. So you have a central message broker to which all of your clients publish and subscribe, uh, publish to and subscribe from. Uh, so, um, so MQTT has this concept of topics, so uh, let's say your light bulbs have one specific topic or you can have hierarchical topics as well um, and AWS of course has their own structure of things. Uh, from there it can essentially split the data stream into whatever business logic components that are required uh, and treat each device differently uh, as necessary. Um, so that's also where, say, certain action items that uh, can happen. For example, uh, let's say your device sends a heartbeat. So uh, this was actually an interesting point of uh, concern for one of our clients. They had a, a smart home system. So uh, smart locks, smart thermostats, etc. connected to a hub, connected to the cloud gateway. Uh, hub is the edge gateway, connected to a cloud gateway and all of this uh, happening over here. The hub was sending a heartbeat uh, every five minutes. We were doing a scale testing for them, starting from uh, 10,000 devices. Uh, they had around 100,000 in production. Their sales forecast was uh, 600,000. So we wanted to validate that their backend can uh, handle it. So we basically simulated that first part of things and um, figure out how the backend behaves architecturally are there any change, are there any drawbacks, are there any design considerations or changes that have to be made. So that certain issues only manifest when you reach a very large scale. So uh, what ended up happening is that heartbeat that happened at 5 minute intervals is what was causing their entire system to break. Uh, so this screen itself can be split into several things, you have your admin logic to enroll certain devices, you have analytics itself to um, get insights from the data your business logic, like I mentioned, uh, whatever you or whatever that you need to implement. Focus areas here. In
sort of has to be exposed. The one endpoint has to be exposed. Similarly, similar to how your um, <coughs> web endpoints are exposed. But what we do here is we use a protocol called NQTTS. Uh, so that implements TLS underneath. There's also a public key private key system. So for example, if you work with AWS IoT, you can, uh, that's the first point here, device provisioning or enrollment. So uh, security, uh, with security in mind, you need to provision uh, devices into your system. So it creates a public key, a private key pair. That's the most common thing. So that gets embedded into the firmware during manufacturing when the firmware is flashed. Uh, and that's what generally is used to connect to your, uh, uh, your broker. Uh, but for development, you can even use user ID password. Most of the MQTT brokers version 5 and above have uh, quite diverse uh, means of connecting to its security. But uh, certificates are the uh, certificates, CA, or the usual stuff. This is the standard thing. Uh, yeah, so device provisioning, Azure uh, kind of led the, uh, kind of had a break, uh, was sort of like a pioneer in this space until uh, recently we have this product called Azure Sphere, wherein uh, during the manufacturing of the device itself, they had uh, certain fingerprints in, um, in, installed there. So even your dev kits, uh, once it's attached to a Microsoft device, you couldn't resell it, you couldn't just transfer it to another developer. Uh, it's permanently attached to your uh, Azure account. So uh, device provision, basically, at the factory itself, you need to uh, include certain things within your firmware uh, that are going to be used downstream. Configurations, of course, can be changed and updated. Any any rolling uh, token logic that you have also need you need to implement some kind of a fetching mechanism right then and there. Real time data processing. This is there in certain uh, uh, sort of traditional software systems as well. But in, in the case of IoT, uh, think of a situation where you have your fingerprint lock that can be considered an IoT system. So here you uh, entered your like you scanned your fingerprint. That processing and validation took, say, your server was busy with some other synchronous task. The response came, say, five minutes later. Uh, or maybe in the meantime, you got validated and you got in itself. The, road, the door will randomly open, right? So that real time aspect, so you need to invalidate certain tokens. So those kind of design considerations uh, kind of need to be made when you are uh, in an IoT environment as well. Certain cases, uh, you need to know when to invalidate data, when to accept data in a timely manner. Uh, in a lot of cases, the database used at time, time series databases, uh, so time scale DB, uh, quest DB, something uh, along those lines. Uh, power and bandwidth management. So, LoRa, for example, is a slightly lower frequency, uh, higher throughput, uh, sorry, lower throughput model. So, in some cases, this is just plain text, right? You don't need a lot of capacity uh, going through the network. Uh, so you can uh, you can basically design your system around whatever budget that you need in terms of power and value. Device experience. This is the biggest pain point that I still have. Uh, so I have a bunch of Wipro lights in my uh, flat. Uh, up until a recent time, basically, if the internet goes, I had no control over my lights. Uh, I found a solution to it. I, I, that was another entire different talk entirely called self-hosted IoT, uh, where you can. Uh, you can sort of hack your devices into using a local server instead of a remote server. So that's your device experience. You need to consider uh, how your device behaves in the system and uh, design your architecture accordingly. And like I mentioned, literally distributed system. You need to factor in what you're going to do, what modifications you're going to do, uh, if, if your system basically has some kind of an issue down the line, or how you're going to handle updates. Uh, challenges that we are uh, that we often face in the IT sector: security, privacy, interoperability. These are like very uh, interesting challenges that are still being addressed. There are solutions to it that are acceptable enough, but ongoing developments in the field are happening. Interoperability being one of the greatest challenges because there are business incentives to ensure that the pros devices don't work with Cisco devices or Google's devices don't work with Apple's devices. Uh, it has gotten much better recently because of certain things that I will uh, show in the coming slides. Development challenges, like I mentioned, the diverse skill set required. So hardware people and software people sort of need to go hand in hand. So you need strict definitions of 
interfa interfaces between the hardware and the software teams. So uh, let's say if you're if you're dealing with JSON, JSON is quite inefficient here. Usually, a lot of industry standards will use protobufs uh, or some kind of interface pattern with uh, point widget type filtering to ensure that the both, all the teams are sort of in sync. Right? Data filtering and optimization. There might be like I mentioned a lot of irrelevant data and oversampling can happen. Collecting too much information that might not be because data is expensive, right? Once you start storing stuff in AWS, you can understand how your costs start surging. I'm sure there might be a lot of stories here of people who have burned their hands with AWS costs. So uh, that's data filtering and optimization. Protobuf is one example of optimizations that if, if like people definitely start off by sending JSON payloads, but eventually you find that understand how much uh, data optimization you can ensure by using some interface like Protobuf. Uh, network and infrastructure constraints. Uh, essentially, uh, there are certain things. Uh, for example, your uh, design requires you to use LoRa and the bandwidth constraints that it has. So, uh, or maybe uh, IP addresses, for example. If if one particular vendor one has this insistence or design consideration that each device will have its own IPv4 address, your IPv4 block is limited. There are you, you kind of need to uh, design around it so that you, you can sort of stick within the allowed limits that are uh, present in you. And Murphy's law basically everything that can go wrong will go wrong in some capacity. So you need to sort of account to best case scenarios and sort of account for failure rates. Because even in hardware when you manufacture, you it's a fun fact that I read that you actually pay uh, around 4x or 8x of what your television costs because the pricing is sort of decided budgeting in failure rates. Similarly, you sort of need to account for certain failures that are bound to happen in this. Yeah. <laughs> now the hope, like I mentioned, standardization. A lot of uh, industry collaborations have happened. Matter is one such protocol I'll show you here. Uh, that have, because a lot of waste happens. I still remember one of the things that sort of made me critical of IoT is there was this bulb that I used uh, that was Bluetooth based. They just removed that app from the Play Store one, sorry, iOS Store one fine day. Uh, and there was no way to control that device at all. This is probably around four years, five years back. Now, that's e-waste basically. I can't turn on that bulb, that uh, or that bulb just keeps blinking, there's nothing you can do about it. That's e-waste. Nothing good comes out. There have been initiatives taken to bring in standardization uh, or like sort of passing uh, past these business incentives and growing together. So Amazon, Google, all of these big players have sort of come across with that's uh, essentially industry collaboration as well. Edge and for computing. Uh, like I mentioned, a lot of these things, uh, a lot of these business logic or application logic need not go all the way to the cloud. If this is a residue from that initial hype phase where connect everything to the internet or connect everything to the cloud. A lot of data need not go all the way to the cloud. If you set a rule saying that my light has to turn on at 6 a.m., that logic need not reside in the cloud. That can stay in your edge gateway itself. And that rule can be executed there. What if I have a power outage or like an internet outage um, in the middle of the night? I don't, I still want to wake up on time, right? So, uh, edge computing for computing paradigms are being uh, installed into IoT systems where you are sort of decentralizing that logic. Uh, and in the age of Web3, we can see how all of this is further going to evolve with distributed application processing. Simulated devices, uh, this has been a gap in the field. Basically, how do you test that your system can handle a very large scale? That's basically what uh, IoT Fire has been trying to solve there. Um, so, a fleet management system before you deploy it, can it handle? 1 million devices or uh, scaled. So there's no way to actually test that uh, because you can't have a hardware test with a 1 million device. Right? So you have some data devices. How are you creating this? Uh, it's a JavaScript based uh, uh, modeling in my thing that you're getting. I can explain off uh, So, matter, this is one of the biggest. Uh, happening things in the IoT space right now. A lot of interesting job opportunities coming here of people who have visibility into the stack. So this has uh, this has big players behind it. Amazon, Apple, Google, uh, your Nordic semiconductors, you have your 
like everything from hardware manufacturing levels to you can see Alexa, Samsung. Samsung is actually one of the pioneers in the IoT space. They they sort of bootstrap the whole MQTT project and everything. Significant contributions. So uh, this this entire stack uh, is sort of it's it's open source. So uh, here you have your standard uh, LAN protocol 802.11. That is uh, low power personal area network, low band. Uh, you have Bluetooth. There's also a ZTE Z wave. This is this is five gigahertz communication where you need slightly larger throughput. You have Wi-Fi. Thread is another protocol from that's pioneered by Google. All of those have uh, that fit into this system. Um, ZTE is mentioned here, but what's more popular is something called Z wave. It's an open source version of ZTE. Uh, so that's essentially where, so even in the uh, application layer, you have uh, meshing involved with them by default. So your devices can sort of form a very large network by interlinking with itself. Uh, so how do you get started? So Raspberry Pi, this is the board that's mentioned here. There's a lot of shortage and stuff going on. You can look for Raspberry Pi alternatives or even just start off with your Linux machine, connect to AWS IoT or connect to Azure IoT. Uh, Home Assistant is an interesting project. This is how I self-host uh, in my IoT services. There's another talk called Self-Hosted IoT. You can, you can look it up on YouTube. Uh, ESP Home is if you want to flash a microcontroller, get, like think around with things yourself. You can. There's an interesting demo edit where you can uh, create your own security camera and all of the logic is written in like, YAML. So, Why do we have so many? No, there is. Uh, so that the problem is backwards. These exist. Now we have to figure out what to do with them. <laughs> we have to. We have to get them to work well with each other. Lora fits in. Yeah, so, so the difference there, uh, so I am not uh, very much like a hardcore uh, L2 guy, but um, essentially the difference happens where in the radio frequencies are happening. For example, Wi Fi is 2.5 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz, LoRa is 433 megahertz, Thread is also 433 megahertz to the best of my knowledge, Zigbee is gigahertz again, Bluetooth is again gigahertz, 2.4 gigahertz. So all of those differences come in where how the connection handshakes take place, how those are established. Uh, uh, basically how, for example, how you pair Bluetooth is not the way that how you connect Wi-Fi, right? Capacity, Capacity throughput, yes, of course. Range. But uh, the handshaking. Range, uh, range also. Range, range also, of course. Of course. So as uh, it's, it's an inverse law, right? Uh, the higher frequency you go, the lower the range is. If you, your 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi will not have the same range as 2.4 gigahertz, but 5 gigahertz has better throughput than 2.4 gigahertz. Those are three Matter is this open standard that's essentially coming. So if you, if you, uh, it's, it's also being adopted. I think Apple HomeKit, Apple in their October announcement essentially uh, showed some of their HomeKit additions to this. So uh, Matter is a layer of abstraction where it gives a lot of libraries that you can use to interface with all of these. So it's open source. So that's the that's the entire uh, you, you know novelty about this. As in you are having an interoperability layer. So things that you buy from uh, Amazon, uh, say say suppose Wipro comes up with a, a partnership with Amazon. Uh, but I use mostly Apple devices in my home. Now there have been cases in the industry where I can't get Apple to work with Wipro at all. Because business incentives. Now this is sort of like a abstraction layer or, or interoperability layer that is coming out in the industry, where you can essentially uh, develop with these uh, libraries and the mesh logic that it, prov it provides. There's a standard provisioning system and everything. So your hub can be from one company. Your appliance can be from another company. Your cloud provider can be from another company, and you can control everything with. Siri, Google Assistant or Siri or whatever. Uh, so I'm running out of time.
think we don't have time, there's a small quiz as well along with the QA. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's basically the talk. One question. Yeah. Since you are a practitioner of all the data, what is the latest trend in runtime implementation of embedded platforms? So, you can update your software. I know somebody is working on it. Participation and all those things. Yeah. So, what is your take on that? Like, what is your experience? Distributed processing. Is there any need for containerization in embedded platforms? Yeah, there is because there is a lot of processing power that stays idle, right? Uh, uh, there's a lot of processing power that essentially stays idle, that's not required essentially, but so so for example when some kind of appliance is on standby, you can use that compute power for something else or... Uh, the upgrade of the software? Uh, yeah, of course, the, all of your container principles also apply to those kind of systems. So you can you can sort of pull and run, uh, you can do rolling updates. Uh, do you see need, uh, since you are a practitioner just Yeah. Do you see need for that? It's an interesting... Concept, I think, yeah, there can be a uh, good application of that. Uh, the thing is, a lot of this like, is not necessary, right? There's a the, a lot of business choices that you make are quite nuanced in terms of that there would be certain applications where that is necessary. Uh, there's a, but then there's a lot of cases where that just becomes an overhead. Virtualization and containerization always has overhead compared to bare but that's not even like a design consideration when you're talking about servers, right? You can't run your Node.js application on bare metal, uh, and it, it's just not practical. You can, of course, but it's not practical. Uh, so those are trade-offs. So that will definitely be uh, an application where that's necessary. So I, I would like to share my experience on that uh, containerization. Basically, I am working on an IoT project in that multiple companies oh, are working. One yeah, uh, so there are multiple companies are working on that. So I prefer containerization because the deployment is easier when multiple companies are working and they will be using different tools and even some companies are using uh, Python for simulation testing and all those things. They have uh, they have different C++ tool chains also. So if containerization present, then yeah, uh, the deployment will be easier. That it will come with the, its own uh, tool chain and it, its own uh, system. Of course. But so are you talking about that on the hardware level? Are you talking about containerization on the edge or the hardware level? Yeah. Yeah, in the IoT hub system. It could in the be IoT hub system. Yeah. Okay. It could be IoT hub, uh, Raspberry. We are not using, we are using... So you are running containers on that, say, container. Yeah, we are using... You run, you run a container D, exactly. container D or something on it? No, 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 not container D. We are okay. using Portman, Docker. Portman, Docker. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And it's a, I mean, um, production level software where it has been developed from uh, 2014 and uh, the first version released on 2021 on, in all the Volkswagen product line and from 2022 uh, for two, uh, 2028, we have uh, one more project which will be in uh, Docker. Oh. Is this, uh, what, what sector is this? IIoT? It, it's automotive. Automotive. Oh, so this is running in the containers, running in the car, is it? Exactly. Oh, that's interesting. And one more question I also have. Yeah. Uh, you have been telling about the LoRa and uh, Wi Fi. So is that like a sensor you are reading through that uh, frequency? Lot of frequency range and then you are transporting this to okay. uh, cloud to Wi Fi? Or yeah, yeah, so I think there is a bit of uh, bias that I have uh, coming from an electronics background. When I talk about sensor, I talk about like silicon, uh, whatever the electronic part of whatever that is. So, whereas when you talk about sensor, you might be talking about the electronics plus the microcontroller. Uh, so, uh, when, when I talk about sensor at its lowest form, talking about something that can get data from the environment, that's it. So that can be a voltage level of it. Then you have a microcontroller and now that microcontroller needs to get that data somehow to the edge gateway. Yeah. Right? So let's uh, let, let's consider uh, your ADAS, uh, your vehicle driver assistance system, yeah. is detecting uh, a rapidly accelerating vehicle coming from the back. Uh, now you have canvas, uh, or can canvas is used in automotive, right? And say hypothetically that your uh, compute is in the front, in 
near your dashboard or something. Now you have a wiring harness to transport this canvas, right? A canvas is an application layer protocol. Uh, you have your differential signaling and everything, but forget that for a moment. So you have, uh, suppose there's no wiring harness, you need to get the signal from the back of the car to the front of the car. Now, you, what is the physical layer that you're going to use to link both of these? Okay. So, LoRa consists of multiple things. One is the base 433 megahertz layer and whatever pulse code modulation or whatever that you are doing to get data through that. And it also handles the negotiation of the master client okay. from, say, say, the sensor is the client uh, uh, and asks the master, how do you negotiate that? All of that comes in the LoRa. So, it transmits the telemetry message. Right. Thank you. Like routers and stuff, right. so right. the ISP can push configuration directly right. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. with TR 069. So, TR 369 is also by the same industry standard body broadband alive. How would that compare to matter? Would you have any insights into that? TR 369. You know, that's an entirely different uh, domain entirely because that's uh, that comes under FOTA, uh, firmware over the air. Okay. Yeah, TR 069 can do firmware. Okay. Over the air, but it also does configuration. Like if you want, the ISP wants that everyone uh, should no longer be able to do WPS okay. or something. You can just push a setting to okay. disable that, or it can change your Wi-Fi password. Nowadays, Airtel has this thing where yeah. you are changing yeah. your okay. Wi-Fi password from your app, and it goes to Airtel and it gets back okay. through TR069. Okay. So that is for network devices. TR069. This TR369 for IoT. Okay. I'm not uh, that good with it, but I wanted to I get your opinion. I uh, check uh, TR369 uh, spec and how it fits into Matter. Uh, actually, Matter is slowly just gaining industry adoption. Um, so, it's, it's still in its early stage. So, most of the clients that we are talking to or uh, people that I've worked with are not on a Matter stack. Uh, right. And it's going to hit consumer IoT first. It's just like, this is more relevant. Uh, but I am not really sure. So uh, that, that that's pretty much diverse, right? Like whatever system that you want. Uh, sorry, the question was, what is the language of development? So uh, uh, let's say your traditional software system can can have quite diverse components. Right? Similarly, in the hardware side, uh, in most cases, it's C, C sharp, whatever whatever you usually write to firmware in. Uh, on the server side, it can be lambda based. Uh, Lambda supports whatever, Golang, Rust, uh, Node.js, all of that stuff. There are companies with Ruby on Rails. Um, yeah, it's quite diverse. Uh, database time scaling is quite popular whenever it comes to time series data. This is an abstraction on top, it's an overlay on top of Postgres. Uh, we personally use something called QuestDB, which is also using uh, Postgres underneath. Uh, yeah, that, that also kind of depends on your use case. Sorry? No SQL databases, again, that depends on the application, right? If it's like rapid pooling of sensor data, it has to be heavily time bound. Uh, but whereas if it's transactional, say uh, these many people got into a building or the, this, this entity has this characteristic, then no SQL makes more sense. But for normal time series data, just keep putting. It's a, it's a design oversight basically, right? because it's taken for granted. The question was the turn indicators that you usually have. Uh, it's a de facto feature in, in your bike or your car, after you turn, it goes off. Whereas in recent electric scooters, that is, uh, according to his uh, personal experience, that feature is missing. So 
that, that uh, there might be some uh, electronic uh, cutoff that would have been going off after the steering turns physically. That physical component might have been removed, they might have put it into the software feature backlog. Might come with a firmware of it. Still is running it. <laughs> Like 
AWS, you kind of hope that they kind of ensure higher availability for. So, is DNS uh, a single point of failure? Uh, see, that DNS is one of the most, if you look at the architecture of DNS, it's actually a very fascinating way how, like, how chaos is sort of bringing together uh, maximum uptime. A lot of network outages and failures have been caused by DNS, but like the, those are sort of exception cases. In in the same way, you can have uh, the that DNS kind of uh, hand pointed at a load balancer and then handle the ingress separately. So that DNS record. So for example, uh, Thomas Robert Thomas Robert is my website. Let's say I have something called MQTT or Thomas Robert. That can focus, that can be pointed at a load balancer that distributes the connections between. There are clustered broker services. Uh, I, I'm forgetting the name. Um, something that I used like last month. Uh, Mosquito is the most common in Mosquito identity broker, but there are clustered uh, brokers as well where you can have distributed uh, load balanced ingress so that uh, your in ingress is not the single point of failure. There are also this availability zone concept that uh, things implement so that uh, your, your traffic is a bit more distributed. Solace can be considered as a uh, uh, Sorry? Solace? Solace sounds familiar. Uh, I haven't used it recently. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure about this uh, activity. Thanks. I have a few stickers uh, here. I thought of distributing it 